Well, we're constantly excited about anything that shows us about big, vast amounts of money going up into space, like the SpaceX booster catch and all the rest of it. But what about something that brings money back down from space? Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Whittle here with Steve Green and Scott Ott. And gentlemen, I saw a story that, that in the space of 10 minutes made me re-envision the future. Really did. So let me give you a little bit of backstory here. Back when I was a uh, junior in high school, I was on the debate team in junior and senior uh, uh, years in, in high school. I know it's going to come as a big shock to people because you definitely are want to talk about being a chick magnet. Um, but my junior year was about alternative, alternative energy sources. This would be in 1976 in high school. And one of the alternative energy sources was microwave-based space power stations. And the idea would be that unlike solar power on the Earth, which is bothered by clouds and gets turned off every 12 hours and turned back on again. A, a solar power grid in space is on all the time. It's getting absolutely as much sunlight as it possibly can. And during the course of this discussion back in 1976, the, w the way we were talking about getting solar power from space was to build this enormous stations that were would be miles and miles across full of these vast arrays of solar cells that would then send a beam of microwave radiation down to a, a, a receiver on the earth that would be a mile in diameter, would absorb all this energy. And I remember being on the negative team for this. I said, what about birds flying across this thing? Aren't these things just going to get nuked? Aren't they just going to explode in midair? I saw an article for a company that's uh, called uh, Etherflex, and they are putting up in the next uh, couple of, uh, I think next couple months, they're putting up a test satellite, which they're calling Apex. Apex is a low Earth orbit solar power station, and it's capable of beaming down to Earth one kilowatt of energy via lasers to a ground station. Kilowatt of energy, they say, is about enough to run a dishwasher. But now comes the revolution in, in, in thinking. Instead of these enormous, multi-billion, probably trillion dollar microwave stations in geostationary orbit, these vast, enormous things that are beaming huge amounts of megawatts or gigawatts of power down to these huge rectangles on the planet, what if you had a receiver on the top of your uh, building or your apartment or your house that looked exactly like a Starlink receiver, and instead of you getting energy from the power grid, which is coming down from space and then going through Con Edison. What if you were getting power that was beamed directly into your house by a series of low Earth orbit satellites that are coming in and out of darkness, but there's an entire constellation of them up there. Essentially, folks, it's Starlink for hmm. energy. Steve, uh, on the right angle we just recorded, you talked about how proud you are to have our, a Starlink station and, and, and have the Starlink service and, and uh, the ability to be a part of the you know, greatest space program in the history of the world and so on. But it's a, it's a fascinating idea because I, I seem to think, I seem to realize I'm certainly not the first person on this train to realize that all of our views about the future from the industrial era that we're coming out of, almost completely out of now, involved vast industrial projects like these mega stations. Yeah. But what if the future of energy independence on Earth consists of a constellation of low Earth orbiting satellites that are beaming you just as much power as you happen to want for, the, for that particular time and doing it around the clock and, and doing it to any place on the planet in the same way that you can get a very fine internet connection if you live out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, uh, this, this is thrilling. Of all the space stories I read, and <laughs> if it's as few as half a dozen a day, I'd be That's surprised. Right. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I'm, Scott, I'm watching you laugh. I know you're in the same boat. Uh, this one is new to me, and it's, it's exciting. I first read about uh, something like, or I didn't even read about it. I was, I was, I was playing, I think it was SimCity 3000, where you get the microwave station power plant. That right. Would, yeah. And if they right. can figure out a way to use laser beams instead of microwaves, well, I'm all for it. And you know why? Because laser beams. Laser beams <laughs> It'd be microwave make lasers. everything cooler. And that's yep. that's just a fact of life. That's that's how I'm wired anyway. Um, so again, what it comes down to is cost, and this is where Elon Musk comes in. I I remember some there was a flashback to something he said in like 2013, 2015, where he was talking about the prohibitive cost of establishing a self-sustaining colony on Mars, because he figures you have to get. X number of tons of stuff, including your people, your water, all, everything you need. You have to get X number of tons of stuff to Mars. And to do that at current launch price, per just per kilogram of mass, it would cost, I believe he said, $25 trillion. Hmm. 
Well, that's not going to happen. At $25 trillion, that's the entire output of the United States economy in a year. And if you're going to do this over the course of 20 years, nobody's going to pay the taxes or the no fees way. or whatever it takes to do that. But he said if you can reduce the cost to orbit to one one thousandth, now you're talking about $25 billion. That's Write a check for that. Yeah, that's doable. He paid $44 billion for Twitter, for crying out loud. Um, uh, yep. Yes, that's completely doable. And that's what Starship is is supposed to do, and, and I hope it does. And one of the things that's going to get those costs down is, is demand. And the genius of, uh, of Starlink is that Starlink generates the demand to generate the cash flow that keeps SpaceX developing Starship. It's it's a, the most mm-hmm. brilliant business plan. It's, br- I, it's I, brilliant. brilliant. It may be the most brilliant business plan in, in, in all of history. Well, there is some upper limit on on Starlink, whether it's the number of satellites you, you're approved to, to put into low Earth orbit, whether it's consumer demand, whatever it is, there, there, there's a top end. That demand is going to top mm-hmm. out. So what are you, you going to do next for revenue? And that that that's been bugging me because you got to keep the cash flow going if you're going to be sending thousands, literally thousands of starships to Mars and, and the moon too, I suppose. Well, everybody needs electricity. Nobody likes pollution. So let's have some satellites with freaking laser beams. <laughs> satellites with freaking laser beams on their heads, man. I couldn't agree more. Scott, I just saw the story before we recorded and, and, uh, and I thought, no, this is a way to re-envision the entire future. Uh, and, and I think the thing that, that really shook me up the most about it was because I'd been, you know, I had that as a debate topic and because I'd been a space freak my whole life, I'm used to thinking of, you know, 20-mile-wide yeah. s- massive girders in, in, in geostationary orbit, you know, and, and, and we used to think that if we were going to have, and in fact, forget used to think, if we had satellite internet before, it used to be, being set up to geostationary satellites that were beaming it back down again, and you've got a significant amount of lag going all the way up there and all the way back down again. Until Elon Musk comes along with the idea, now we're just going to throw things out there basically the size of a deck of cards, and they're just going to be in low Earth orbit, and they'll decay, and we'll just replace them with new ones. I think what I'm trying to get at, Scott, is if somebody asked me if I had you know a billion dollars or $2 billion to spend on defense, and they said, would you like another Ford-class aircraft carriers, or, or, or would you like 10 million drones? I, I really think I'd yep. take the 10 million drones. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, th- I think, uh, you know, remember a couple of years ago, there was a lot of talk about a space elevator uh, where they yes. would basically yeah. have a cable running from the planet up into some place in geostationary orbit with a counterweight on the end of it. And they'd run essentially an elevator yep. car up and down <laughs> this cable. So I think maybe uh, we don't even have to use freaking laser beams. We could just run an extension cord down the space <laughs> elevator. <laughs> Oh, that's a that's a real that's yeah. A real possibility. Uh, no, my I've also heard the real, the real challenge for the space elevator is the tensile strength of of the cable. Got to you got to tether an, well, ast- I've, an I've asteroid. I've also to heard that the movement of that cable actually generates significant static electricity. <laughs> Um, and so if, if we could somehow harness that. No, I think what we're talking about here is just kind of, it, it's the excitement that I have that you two both share of every day reading the latest things that are going on, especially regarding space science and, and the ideas that people are exploring. And, you know, just before we came on, we were talking, there's a, there's a company right now that is trying to 3D print a rocket ship from carbon fiber. Um, that's awesome. You know, like, go ahead. Let's try to do these things. Let's try to get uh, power sources. Uh, I, I think the, the the first thing I think of when I think of a decentralized power grid is the difficulty of disabling it from by one of our enemies. Um, Exactly. Yeah, so and and I think that not enough attention is given to that. If you live in one of these communities that got shattered by Hurricane Helene or the the, the hurricane that followed that, exactly. you start thinking about that. It's like, wait a minute, the entire town water system was wiped out, the entire power grid was wiped out, the cell service in that area was wiped out. 
it's because we centralize so many of these things. The more we can decentralize things, the more we can minimize the impact of natural disasters or of enemy attack. Um, and we are super vulnerable, especially in our power grid. And if the power grid is attacked and that fails, then all of the computers that not only run our lives and make it possible for live to live like kings, frankly, in this in this country. Um, also, it, it makes it impossible for us to defend ourselves. And so, you know, this anything that we can do to advance the science of uh, disaggregated power generation and reception, I'm all for. So, I, I agree with Steve and Scott. I mean, I, I happen to think this technology is going to work. Well, it's not up to me for it'll work or not, but <laughs> But there's certainly nothing wrong with it in terms of the physics. And what what um, Starlink shows us, Starlink actually has a predecessor to to this idea of one big satellite. And and it's a it's a well-known predecessor and it, and it preceded Starlink by 30, 40 years. And that's GPS. GPS is a series of, of satellites that are in higher they're higher than low Earth orbit, but there's just depending on a lot of them. It's not like one satellite that everybody can see. There's a constellation of them that, that are up there. You need three or four for a good fix. And if you put enough of them up there, there will always be enough GPS satellites in the sky at any given time to let you find your way down to the local uh, Baskin Robbins or whatever the case may be. This kind of an idea for power is a profoundly future altering idea. Now, it's going to clearly, at least in the early stages, not going to be practical for people who live in large cities for yeah. the same reason that Starlink is not really good for me living in Los Angeles. I could have Starlink in Los Angeles. There's only a certain number of satellites overhead at any given time, no matter how many it puts up there. And if everybody of the 10 million people that lived in the city was on Starlink, I'd run out of bandwidth. But if you're sitting in a cabin in the middle of some place, you've got, you've got high-speed internet to anywhere in the world. And if uh, Etherflux and, and its Apex satellite and, and any competing companies that are going to arise... If we get to the point where we're no longer talking about giant power stations, but essentially a constellation of power orbiting satellites that can beam electric electrical power directly to your to your cabin in the woods, then all of a sudden getting off the grid is a is a, a real possibility because you don't even need the grid anymore. You go places where there is no grid. You, there's no grid to get off. For Steve Green and Scott Ott, I'm Bill Whittle. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time right here on Right Angle.